Um, so this is our mid-summer installment of our cyber speaker series here, and I am delighted to have Katie Musoris here. Katie is um, a hacker first, and then a hacker of policy and regulations, as she describes it. Katie has been an all-star leader in the field in uh, studying, understanding, figuring out what to do about zero-day vulnerabilities, vulnerability markets. She was a lead figure in the design of the bug bounty program at Microsoft. She has been the leader of designing programs for the Pentagon and the Army, hack the Pentagon, hack the Army. Um, she is a leading expert on this. She's also one of the um, US representatives, one of only two US representatives to renegotiating the Wassenaar um, arrangement on export controls. Two non-government. People. Two non-government, yes. oh, two sorry. industry folks. Two they, industry trust folks. Trust me, we send an army. We can almost do man-on-man -man defense in that, in that show. <laughs> but go on, yes, I will not interrupt my introduction any further, go ahead. Okay, um, and um, will correct me on everything I say wrong, but Katie. I just didn't want to say that, you know, no, it's just me. It's me and nobody else. No, it's, it's non-government. Fair right. enough. Yeah. And Katie is also a visiting scholar at the MIT Sloan School um, and a, um, what is this, a uh, visiting scholar also at the New America Foundation and a uh, affiliate at Harvard's Belfer Center. Um, I will leave it to Katie to say more, uh, and this will be a very interesting talk. Thanks for coming. Okay, thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be here. Um, I never quite know what to expect in audiences like this, so before we really get into the presentation, if you will indulge me, how many of you do cybersecurity for a living? Okay. How many of you do policy work for a living? Okay, how many of you came here because somebody dragged you here saying there's some pink haired weirdo in the building and aha, okay, yes, all right. So you are the folks who have no idea what it is that's about to happen. Okay, great. Um, no, I appreciate it. So, um, so as I was telling Jackie when she asked me to come and speak, um, I'm actually giving an adapted presentation that I gave just a couple weeks ago um, when the NATO, uh, Cybersecurity Summit asked me to come and keynote their conference in Tallinn, Estonia. Um, so how many of you are familiar with some of the events that happened in Estonia about a decade ago? Right? That was one of the first targeted acts of cyber war that we can, you know, that we can think about. The Russians attacked Estonia. And as a result, over the last 10 years, Estonia has had to lead, you know, themselves and the world in you know, critical infrastructure response against cyber attack, et cetera. We're not gonna talk about that in this presentation, but I wanted to set context that for a mixed audience like NATO, where you've got military folks and policy folks and security practitioners, I was hoping that I would get a decent mix here and it turns out that I guessed correctly. So there have been a couple of updates to this presentation. And of course, we'll have time for Q&A. Feel free to interrupt me during the talk. I think I can handle it. Um, but also, we will have you know, probably about half and half um, during the hour and a half that we have. So don't be panicked that you will not get a chance to talk to me and ask me questions. Um, I have no idea how I got my hair this color, so that is, that is off the table. We're not discussing it. Okay, so government, the private sector, and zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, hopefully, you're familiar with the term zero-day vulnerabilities. Generally speaking, it's vulnerabilities for which uh, there is no patch or there's limited knowledge of that vulnerability such that it's, it's very difficult to protect against it. How many of you think zero days are our biggest problem you know, in cybersecurity? Good, we have an educated group. Not a single hand went up and I am so pleased because the media talks about zero days all the time as if it's the worst thing. That would be like talking about Ebola all the time in the Western world when we actually don't have a credible threat of Ebola. You know, there may be some isolated cases, but majority of attacks that happen on the internet have nothing to do with zero day. So why am I going to talk about it? Well, I'm gonna talk about it in the context that security often focuses our efforts in what I call the theater of the absurd. Are any of you familiar with the play Waiting for Godot? Oh, wow, readers, I'm amazed. So <laughs> that is, you know, that was, these are existential, that's an existential play in the style of the theater of the absurd. And when I apply that idea to cybersecurity, I find a lot of the activities that even I myself and my fellow practitioners who have been professionally in this industry for 20 years, that is, yes, that is an accurate number for me. Um, 
that we find ourselves exercising the same tactics over and over again. Once we see that there might be a new tactic that we can try, a new strategy we can try, we suddenly glom over to that. And one of the things I'm going to talk about in this presentation are the accurate ways to use some of these fancy buzzwords like bug bounty. How many of you have heard about bug bounties? Right. So it's all the rage right now. I'm partially responsible for that. I'm going to talk about how to dial it back and use it appropriately. But first, OK, um, a little bit about me. How many of you have heard of me before I came here? OK, my friend and Jackie and one other person and the people in the workshop. So if you are unfamiliar with me, this is a word cloud from Twitter of things I tweet about the most. So you can see what's really important to me. Very important things. Um, somebody uh, actually put it on my Wikipedia page that I'm known for computer security and karaoke. This is accurate. Um, we're not going to do that here. Not now. Um, but you know, essentially, I started my own company, Luta Security, over a year ago. And it was really to address this problem that, honestly, my preaching to the choir of getting people to do bug bounties has taken off to the point where nobody actually has any process knowledge of how to do that work on, on the back end. So that's what my company does. Formerly, I was a security strategist for Microsoft and helped them uh, start their very first bug bounty programs, among other activities that I created for them, Microsoft Vulnerability Research, wrote their vulnerability disclosure policy, et cetera. But that's also how I got roped into doing standards work, which is how I got roped into doing policy work. Because otherwise, how would a hacker end up writing an ISO standard? That sounds like the worst career move imaginable. Um, and certainly nothing I would have had the patience for in my 20s. Um, so I needed to be a, a little bit older and, and seeing you know, further. Um, Luckily, I became a New America Cyber Fellow, which is how I met Jackie, who invited me here. Um, Sloan Visiting Scholar, I will talk about that briefly. Um, I became involved with uh, doing some system dynamics modeling of the vulnerability and exploit market with uh, MIT Sloan School. And we have a number of papers that are in various stages of almost published, as you know, I kind of leave it to them, the academics, to find the vehicles to do so. At least one of the papers that we wrote will be coming out in some book on MIT Press in the fall. I don't know the title of it, so I literally am not even shamelessly plugging it. I'm just letting you know. There's work that will come out there. Um, the cyber export control renegotiator item, that, that pointer doesn't point. Um, that is my work on what's called the Vassanar Arrangement. How many of you are aware of the Vassanar Arrangement? OK, for those of you who are not familiar, that is, uh, it is a, a voluntary agreement between 41 different countries who all get together and make high-level agreements about export controls of traditionally um, you know, kinetic weapons, nukes, the technology to create nukes, that kind of thing, composites, things that are used to build things that are of national security importance. So they meet at the Vassanar level as countries, make agreements about export controls, and then they go back to their, their native countries and implement the export control rules domestically according to their laws. So why am, I, why am I doing export control? I'm doing export control because in 2013, those 41 countries all agreed to add some new controls on cyber weapons. Essentially, the technical terms was intrusion software, intrusion software technology. But think about it in terms of surveillance software, things that can be installed on a phone, um, you know, things that can be used to bypass the protective countermeasures of a device in order to do something bad. right? And I think the original guise of it was national security concerns, but also human rights abuse concerns. If you think about it, some of these pieces of software, while they have legitimate law enforcement capabilities, and you know you should be able to get a warrant and put one of these pieces of software to surveil a target you know, on a phone, something like that, you should be able to do that legally. But some, some repressive regimes were buying these pieces of software and using it to target political dissidents, journalists, people who you know, essentially were vulnerable. And so part of the reason why they put it in the Vassanar arrangement was to try and get a handle on who was creating these tools and giving them to whom. And not necessarily to stop the flow of them, but really to understand where they are going and how they are used. Now, unfortunately, just how many of you write code or have written code ever in your lives? OK, you have all written bugs myself included. So all code has the capacity to, to contain bugs. 
all legal code has the capacity to contain bugs. So what I'm doing right now as a cyber expert control renegotiator is I'm helping to debug what they wrote initially. They meant to define these things very narrowly, but instead they ended up catching a whole bunch of different software and technology that I'll go into of how it impedes internet defense, but they ended up catching a whole lot of stuff that they didn't mean to. Um, so it's been over a year now that I've been working on that process. But yeah, back to the absurdist theater. So this was just a little primer. You don't have to read the thing. There are enough of you that actually read that, that I don't have to familiarize you with the play itself. Um, but why are we here? Well, you know, originally, as we know, we didn't build the internet for all of its uses today. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we basically built it on a, a bunch of silly string and, and, and openness that in a, initially was a great idea for academic purposes. And it was a great idea when only trusted people were talking to each other about trusted things. But quite frankly, you know, it wasn't built for the capacity and the uses and the societal uses that we have for it these days. And our dependence on the technology has grown faster than we can secure it, especially in the United States. Why are we particularly vulnerable? Well, we were the first to roll it out. We have the majority of the technology companies that run the software that runs the internet. Um, and we just have a very large population that's, that's dependent on critical infrastructure. OK, so hackers. Does anybody know who these people are? It's not the Last Supper of Congress. <laughs> much as we might be interested in that happening. No, um, the, the, the gentleman in the middle with the fancy uh, you know, Jesus haircut, that's Mudge, AKA Peter Zatko, AKA a uh, man who had joined DARPA a few years ago. So we all, we have this joke, we used to fight the man, now we are the man. Um, so this is a group of hackers known as the Loft. And this group of hackers, I grew up with these guys in Boston, and we were all on the same BBS, bulletin board system. It would be the equivalent of IRC or some kind of chat. But these are my compatriots. And this was them testifying before the US Congress in 1998, saying that the internet's too fragile, and it can be taken down by a single packet in about 30 minutes. He was talking about a BGP attack. He didn't discuss it with the rest of them before he actually said that in front of Congress. But it was, it was a powerful statement, but where are we now? We've been warning you. Hacker Jesus has been warning you this entire time. And yet, the internet is still fragile. So here we are, right? Who recognizes this? This is, this is some, one of the screenshots, yep, of the ransomware that has come out. Now, the ransomware that has been hitting us recently, how many of those things were due to zero days, for which there is no patch? Right, correct, none. So, Remember way back, okay, there's a very young audience here. Okay, history time. Um, this is a time I call the age of the great worms, right? Back in the early 2000s, you were having worms ripping through the internet just over and over again. This was before Microsoft had made a pledge to do trustworthy computing, right? Bill Gates wrote this famous memo, this trustworthy computing memo. Why? Because worms were ripping through the infrastructure, and the biggest customer of Microsoft at the time was the United States government, and they said, buddies, we're about to rip you guys out and replace you with Linux everywhere, Linux on the desktop, if you don't get a handle on this. And what's funny is the worms were ripping through the internet six months after a patch was available from Microsoft. So even back then, we were struggling with this problem. This isn't a zero-day problem. This is a patch deployment problem. And we still have it today, despite Hacker Jesus warnings, despite all of the best practices and the absurdist security theater that we've all been, you know, that we've all been preaching. And when I was a professional hacker for hire, meaning people would hire me, I'd hack them and I would show them what, you know, what, where the flaws were and how to fix them. I mean, I spent seven years doing this and I really wasn't finding anything new under the sun, even in my existing clients, right? So you just come back and see the same thing over and over again. The same types of vulnerabilities, even if they patched it on the initial system you tested. They've got a new system over there that was provisioned with the same issues going on and the same either not up to date patching or really configuration issues. So much of security is really about proper configuration and proper patch management. And it's not sexy and it doesn't sound like zero days and cyber war and all these like funny buzzwords that we hear. It's very pedestrian and basic, and yet we haven't gotten a handle on it. 
So yes, everything is broken, but even when, <laughs> even when a patch is available, we still haven't managed to push them out in a reasonable manner. And there are lots of reasons for that. It's not just laziness. A lot of it is that the infrastructure just isn't there. A lot of it is that we have competing regulations that say, if you have critical infrastructure, you have to pass all of these testing, you know, the huge testing harness in order to get to the point where you're allowed to make a change to that critical system. So we, we have built up a series of best practices, regulations, and whatnot, but we still lack you know, the automated capability to make sure that as soon as a fix is available, that it's applied as soon as possible. We still lack that, not just in the United States, but in the world. And if you think about it, when, um, when we have some of the largest organizations and largest governments unable to get a handle on this problem, imagine every little healthcare office, every little dentist office, every little place where your personal data, things that affect your lives, are, they are absolutely outgunned. How many of you, oh, guaranteed all of you, OPM hack victims? Yeah, I didn't even, I should have just said, hold your hand up if you weren't a victim in the OPM hacks. So the fact that civilian non-cleared people like me know what OPM is, is, is pretty sad. But the fact that we expected a bureaucratic office, one little subdivision of a giant, you know, of a giant government, to be able to stand up against a nation state level attack, it's unrealistic, right? So again, we've got all of these different problems at different levels. Okay, so quick, what? Just regulate, right? Regulate our way, just regulate on through. Um, again, when I was saying about the Vassenaar arrangement, this was an attempt to control this type of software and this type of technology know-how. But it's a little bit different when it comes to software. It's a little bit different in terms of controlling it and controlling the knowledge, especially when the software security industry grew up out of people like me and my, and my fellow hackers, right? Our whole deal is that we exchange information across borders. We do it across uh, company lines. We do it across country lines. We do it across nationality lines. We do this all the time. And we just came from a week in the desert where there were three different conferences running, you know, sort of overlapping, but the original one, the oldest one in the United States that's of that size, 25 years of DEF CON, I always look forward to this one party that's really hard to get into, and yet one of you who was here yesterday during the forum, I saw him in there, and I was like, how the heck did you get into this party? But it's a party where it's not, you know, a wild hacker time with the DJs and the unsa unsa. it's not that kind of party. It's a trusted group of us who have been going for so long that I even got a biker jacket that they made for me um, with my original area code on it. Because you know we often identify our hacker tribes by area code. Where did you first dial into the internet? So this, 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 private, you know, this private party is an example of where we're doing the exact kind of exchange that's beyond any kind of export control licensing regime. These are trust relationships that have been built over 20 years or more. Those people in the, you know, in the, in the Congress photo, some of them, we've known each other since we were teenagers, 30 years. You can't replicate that, and quite frankly, you can't stop it by some regulations. And more importantly, you shouldn't. So, you know, I already kind of went through this. It ends up catching software and technology that's useful for defense. And quite frankly, the reason why I was chosen as one of two non-government industry experts to come and talk to them about this and get it changed was because it actually, the language that they wrote, the buggy regulatory code, breaks the ability of the internet to defend itself. And I'll talk about why. OK, back to the security theater, though. Does anybody, yes, that, the look on your face is actually perfect. This is absurd. Um, <laughs> So KiwiCon 9, a couple years ago, uh, I told them, I said, how would you feel if, you know, I descended from a metal hoop spinning from the ceiling and sang live karaoke, and then I gave a keynote? And they were like, that sounds great, mate. You know, whatever, I can't do their accent. But they, they said, yeah, that's great. Do you want backup dancers? Also, we have pyro. And I was like, oh, God. Oh, God. What have I done? Yes. So I did it because they told me. They, they made me do it. I mean, I suggested it. It was a terrible idea. But I did it. 
Um, and the theater part of it was actually to get the attention of that particular hacker audience in that area to galvanize them to be interested in talking about something as dry and boring as policy and regulation. I don't think I needed to do all that, but anyway, I did it. So, um, so but that was, part of the, that was part of the thing. There are very few of us who have a solid practitioner, technical hacker background who are willing to fall on regulatory and policy grenades. And I just wanted some friends <laughs> to help. So I did that. Um, I tried to make a joke for you guys that you wouldn't let me. I don't know if you see that, but yes, you wouldn't let me bring the pyro. So it came from here. It burned my eyebrows off. It was really, that I'm behind there. That's, that's me in the middle. Anyway, <laughs> that's not Photoshopped. My hair was brown before. Anyway, um, but that's also me uh, about to press the, the doorbell to get into the dedicated space where they have in Vienna, where the experts meet three times a year, around April, around June, around late September, early October. That is where the renegotiating happens. So literally from theater of the absurd, please my friends, hacker friends, I pay attention because I need your help, uh, all the way to Good Lord, they let me in this place. Here I am right here with my finger right next to the Vostanar button. They keep inviting me back, so it must be OK. Um, but what were they blocking? How many of you have ever seen this image before? OK, a couple. Of, oh, yes, because you, have a pre, you did your homework and, and uh, found every presentation I've ever made on the internet. Oh, god. Um, I had to add this little star here because enough people seeing this thing were like, no, I have your signature. It's not my real signature. Yes, I signed it. It's not my real signature. But what this is, is the very first $100,000 bounty that I paid a security researcher for bringing Microsoft knowledge of a brand new exploitation technique. How many of you think you know the difference between a vulnerability and an exploit? OK, a couple of you. So a vulnerability is just the whole, right? An exploit is a piece of code that is written to actually take advantage of that hole in software. What is an exploitation technique then? It's not just an exploit. It's not proof of concept code. It's not malware. It's a brand new way to bypass the protective countermeasures that are built into the system. Does that language sound familiar? It's exactly what Wassenaar was capturing. So what I was telling them when I would come is that, look, I created Microsoft's bug bounty programs. A bug bounty, anyone know what that is? It's usually, you know, it's a cash reward in exchange for vulnerability information. And traditionally, this was started, you know, back in, in the Netscape days. Traditionally, it was one bug, one bounty, right? Well, modern exploitation normally requires a series of bugs strung together to form an exploit chain. And there is a technique associated with it that is used to bypass everything that the manufacturers have done to make exploitation harder. Those are the mitigations, right? So what this was is a $100,000 mitigation bypass bounty. This is for a technique. Techniques are rare. Microsoft would hear about them maybe once every three years. Academic presentation, maybe finding some malware in the wild that used a new technique we had never seen before, but very rare. How long do you think it takes to fix something that is an, an actual bypass of all of the platform mitigations? Is it like a Patch Tuesday kind of thing? Right, Microsoft has enough problems with the one bug at a time thing, right? Let alone architecture level changes. So it made sense for Microsoft to pay six figures for something that was rare, and incredibly valuable for defense. We'd need a huge amount of lead time compared to the attackers. And guess what? The attackers have exploitation techniques they can use right now. They're not buying those things. They don't need them. Why invest in new technology when you have existing methodology to get your goals, right? So in this sense, this was, an, this was a structured incentive program designed to get information that was rare and valuable only to the manufacturer. Hence, big price tag. So his name was James Forsha. He was British, former British intelligence, now works for Google. At the time, he was you know, with a consulting company. When I launched this bug bounty program, it was June 2013, when the Boston arrangement 
ratified the new language was December 2013. I already got it straight from my old Microsoft lawyer that if the Vassanar arrangement had been in place at the time, there would have been no way we could have started that program. We would not know about this and any of the countless other exploitation techniques that have been given to Microsoft since that program has started. The price has gone up a little bit. I think it's at 150 right now. But the people who are participating have changed. James was British. The British, in their own export control regime, have implemented the Vassanar rules. So they have export controls in place that match the languages in the current Vassanar arrangement. There are only two countries out of the 41 that have not implemented these changes domestically in their own export controls. We're one. And New Zealand, for some reason, with the fire and the everything, is the other one. I don't know why. Um, but no, it, I, I don't think that had to do with it. I don't think it was Pyro that conv convinced them. They were already convinced um, that, that the Vassanar language itself needed to be debugged. Mm. And also, the giant check idea, that was James's. He, he pictured you know, me writing him a giant check, so I immediately contacted the marketing people and said, James wants a giant check. Let's give him a giant check. That, so, that check is fake, though, because you look at the numbers on the bottom. Yes, you are pointing out the numbers at the bottom. You know what? Somebody asked me for a bounty for figuring that out. Does anybody, off the top of your head, can you just you know, translate the binary to the ASCII to the, or binary to, yeah, to the ASCII number? Yeah, it says, it says Microsoft. It's okay. I'll give you that one. <laughs> anybody else notice 31337, check number, elite, right? That is elite speak. So yeah, all kinds of jokes, making jokes and everything. Um, I did want him to try and cash it, though, and I wanted him to videotape it, but he didn't do this for me. Why? Um, so anyway, let's see. Oh, hilarious. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I've had my computer off for a while. Oh, no, wait, that's yours. No, that's mine. OK. So how did we get, in terms of incentives, how are we doing on time, by the way? OK, how did we get from? Microsoft to the Pentagon, AKA, no way we're not paying for any vulnerability information. This was stated by one of the Microsoft executives back in 2008 to, okay, for pay, and also at $100,000 a pop, you know, for certain things, which was at the time the very highest vendor bug bounty program in existence. There were contests that would happen once a year that had similar payout. In, a, in the defensive realm. But Microsoft was the first one to have an ongoing program at that, at that level. Okay, this is me. Um, you know, the, the black hoodied hacker image I think is just so overused. I mean, this, is, uh, this was me actually doing, well, I blanked my screen, but essentially I was pen testing video games. If you can see this, that's, that's a PlayStation 2 unit. I had a couple of those. but. Um, you know, we, we all heard about Sony being attacked pretty relentlessly and everything. Um, this was, you know, this picture was taken probably over a decade ago. So it's not like they weren't spending money on security. They had security staff, very dedicated folks that I interacted with there. Um, they had professional penetration testers, totally professional, pink hooded professionals, right? They had, um, and, you know, we weren't the only consultants in there doing that. But one of the things that why I illustrate this is not to pick on Sony, it's to say that this was a turning point for me as a practitioner of the dark arts, or the pink arts in my, in my case. Um, this was a turning point where I was finding the same types of bugs that I would always find for my clients. Okay, this is you know, potential authentication bypass, here's where credit card numbers might be stolen, all of that stuff. And they said, yep, yep, put it on the list. We're really, really concerned with game cheating. Figure out how they could cheat at this title. I was like, what the? Cheating? Don't you care about the credit cards? Shouldn't that be the thing? And they said, no, we have risk management for that. What we don't have risk management for is if a game title is so cheatable that it becomes unplayable, and then our entire investment in that game title goes to nothing. The game is dead, and there's nothing we can do to recover. That's what they wanted. And so for me, I was like, oh, right. Business goals matter when I'm assessing security. So it allowed me to grow this empathy. And so when I hear my friends, hacker friends, saying, so-and-so should just pay a bug bounty, I realize that they're lacking all of these layers of empathy where they're not necessarily understanding what are the forces that are keeping an organization from offering a bug a cash reward. 
Okay, so this is from one of my other gaming friends, you know, Riot Games. This is an image from Riot Games, and uh, David Rook, who runs their application security, used this, and I just thought it was so great because this is the despair I felt when I realized that I can keep practicing the same security theater best practice stuff over and over again for my clients, and actually all, all code has security bugs, and I'm never going to make a difference one client at a time, one bug at a time. So I got really sad. Um, this is from Twitter, where all important information is apparently disseminated these days. But essentially, what you can't really read, you'll see, the, I think I gave the slides so you can see them later. But, you know, that intersection, that sweet spot that everybody wants, they want it secure, they want it fast, they want it cheap, it's not going to happen, right? There's some overlap here. So, one of the things that I keep hearing over and over again, and again, I'm partially responsible for this, is everybody should run a bug bounty program. I hear, why don't we apply the bug bounty idea to this other area? And all I keep thinking is, you have no idea the preparation that went into every single bug bounty that you see in major organizations and governments today. I've even seen a proposed bill, how many of you have seen there's a, a proposed bill for DHS that would mandate running bug bounty programs? Do you think DHS? all of it, and OPM, and all of the little agents in all of these places, do you think they have the capacity to handle the bugs they already know about, let alone open up a floodgate and pay hackers money to find more? So I used a, a, an old, old reference uh, yesterday of Lucy and Ethel in the Chocolate Factory. So for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, Lucille Ball had a comedy show, it was black and white, I watched it as a kid because I'm old, and uh, basically it was a comedy sketch routine. They're working in a chocolate factory and they're supposed to put the little wrappers on the chocolate coming down the conveyor belt. And the slapstick comedy is that it's coming too fast, so they start eating, and then they start stuffing, and they run out of places to stuff that chocolate. So think about bug bounty programs as a source of faster chocolate, right? If you don't have the capacity on the, on the rest of the conveyor belt, you are Lucy and Ethel, it's comedy gold at best. It's a disaster at worst. So what are the basics of getting there, right? Vulnerability disclosure. The act of somebody reporting a vulnerability to you who does not work in your organization, that can be a partner, a customer, a hacker, a friend, you know? <laughs> It could be, you know, it could be anybody, anyone outside of your organization reporting a vulnerability to you, and then the act of you processing that somehow and then disseminating the solution or your resolution choice, even if it's not to fix it, out to the affected parties. That's vulnerability disclosure, and that's the basic process that most people lack. Penetration testing, how many of you heard of that? I've been talking about it. I used to be a professional penetration tester, hacker for hire, right? That is get outside help under contract who are experts to tell you about more and pay the money, right? That's been an accepted practice for a long time, but I remember back when it used to be hard to convince organizations to hire professional hackers. They were like, what do you mean? They're probably criminals. They have funny colored hair. I don't trust them. What, what will keep them from just harvesting all the bugs and not telling us and using it later? And we had to overcome those concerns about our ethics way, way, way back in the late 90s, early 2000s when we started doing this professionally. Now, fast forward, regulations have required penetration testing. You know, PCI requires external pen testing for a certain level, all of these things. So everyone accepts pen testing now. So where are we now? We're at the dawn of the next stage of incentives, which is bug bounty. And it's, it's an opening of that aperture. It's an opening of the funnel to hear about more bugs from more people and potentially pay them. However, as you can tell, you know, if you don't actually have a process to handle that delicious chocolate of bugs coming in, and you haven't even gotten past you know, hiring professionals that you control, they're under NDA, you're not obligated to fix anything just because a pen tester found it. You know? I mean, you, you are if you need to meet regulatory compliance, but nobody's going to threaten you and, and say, we're going to talk at a conference or we're going to drop a zero-day exploit on you in a penetration test, all the way to a flow of bug chocolate that you can't really control, which is bug bounties. So I just added the slide. 
because I was, I was quoting a stat that's just recently been updated. So in 2015, we had done a market study and 94% of the Global 2000, you know, the Forbes Global 2000, had no front door to report a vulnerability. So no way to even do the vuln disclosure part, let alone a bug bounty, right? Who knows what's behind the conveyor belt, you know, back there. So 2017, a lot more organizations have decided they're going to start a vuln disclosure program or a bug bounty program or whatnot. But the image in the background is of that false front. And here's what I'm really worried about from a policy perspective. When I see laws that are proposed where DHS should just run a bug bounty, or the, yesterday there was a bill uh, covering IoT security that, that has some good stuff in it, like we should know the ingredient list of, of our IoT software that we buy and use in the, in the US government. We should know what open source packages are in there. They shouldn't have known vulnerabilities in them, you know, et cetera. That's all good stuff. But then they also added, and they all should follow ISO 29147 for vulnerability disclosure and have a vuln disclosure program. And I'm like, you know, without guidance, that could just look like a front door and there's nobody there. And they would be able to claim compliance with this and that's actually weakening, you know, weakening their ability to respond to security and weakening the security posture of the government who's, using, who's trying to use this act to acquire more secure and more securable software. So, this is what I, I remind people of, of the long history of how we got here and how we're only now ramping out of the technology companies and moving into, these are companies that have bug bounties, right? 2013, that's when Microsoft started. Now we've got things like cars, Tesla, we've got financials, we've got the Department of Defense. So these are finally catching on in non-technology, strict technology sectors, but it took a long time to get here. And I'm concerned from a policy perspective and a trending perspective of this really getting out of control. So how did we, how did we structure these and why are they different and why did it not result in Lucy and Ethel in the chocolate factory? You know, back, back. Um, Microsoft, before the bug bounties, was receiving over 200,000 non-spam email messages a year to secure at Microsoft. That was just people reporting things for free. So, of course, the executives were afraid that if we dangle cash, my God, we can't possibly throw more money at this problem. And I said, well, that's why we do structured incentive programs. So I already went through the mitigation bypass, which was at $100,000. $50,000 was for new defensive ideas. I think that's been raised up to $100,000 by now. And then this other one, this last one, $11,000 for Internet Explorer 11 beta bugs. So at the time, 2013, Internet Explorer 11 was about to be the next version of IE. We were getting reports for IE, right, for IE bugs, for free. But we were getting them at a very inconvenient time. So this, can you see this slide? This was the actual slide I used to convince the head of IE to pay for his own bugs. So what you're looking at is there is a low white graph and then a white spike, right? That represents real data for how many bugs that we would fix with a bulletin, meaning a critical or important class bug, according to Microsoft. How many bugs were we getting that fit that, that class during the beta period of IE10? Hardly any. It's a little trickle. And then we were getting a giant spike after when? After the code freeze. After it was finalized and out of beta. Well, if we had all of these altruistic hackers who were willing to do it for free, why were they waiting? They were clearly finding them. Were they doing it to mess with us? Or were they doing it because the only incentive they had at the time was the chance for their name to appear in a bulletin? That was all we were giving them. And so they would hold during the beta period because typically a bug fixed in beta gets no bulletin. So we had created a perverse incentive for these hackers. Now on the offense market, so the government buyers, criminal buyers, they weren't buying in beta either, because why would they pay six figures, because that's the going price for, the, for bugs, uh, bugs and exploits at that level. Why would they pay six figures for a bug that could evaporate for them in the beta period and no customer targets you know, of, of their campaigns would even be targeted, right? So we had an open market during the beta period where we could name our price. And so my logic was we can shift the traffic spike to some time that's totally advantageous to our engineering group. We can, in fact, almost form a peer testing group with these outside hackers. 
So we put a bug bounty at the beginning of the IE 11 beta period. That spike was the projection of what I thought you know, would happen during that month. And actual results, we got 18 bulletin class vulnerabilities. I paid around $27,000, $28,000 for them total. Total. So we proved that if we understood the incentives, understood the markets, understood the perverse incentive that we had created with just this, you know, giving credit in a bulletin, that we could shift our already altruistic hackers' eyes and even a few less altruistic hackers to the beginning. Because if you think about it, even those who would generally wait for the big payouts of you know, the offense market, if they didn't try and cash in on some of their bugs early, well, some of their bugs are going to be dead anyway. So they might as well turn some in in the early phase. So we were targeting the altruists, and we caught a few more. We, caught some, we had some finders come to us who we had never seen before, and they had excellent, excellent submissions. OK, so then we went to the Pentagon. So at that time I was at Microsoft, I gave a lecture at MIT, Harvard. You know, there was a little symposium. The, um, the uh, policy director for the Office of the Secretary of Defense was there, my friend Mike Solmeyer. And he said, will you give the Pentagon a briefing? And so over several years, again, like I said, this takes time to prepare that conveyor belt. Over several years of consultation, Finally, the Pentagon was actually ready, and they had some really key folks inside the Pentagon who navigated all of the bureaucracy, and I answered their questions until we got to this. So, hack the Pentagon. How many of you heard of it? How many of you played? Did anyone play? Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, essentially, it was open to anyone who was a U.S. citizen or had a, a U.S. social security number, and that was just not necessarily for um, restriction purposes on who was looking at the Pentagon stuff. It was basically ease of, of payout and they wanted, they also, the Pentagon also wanted no felons because they didn't want taxpayer money going to felons. So there were a lot of philosophical things around that and practical things of why it was restricted that way. But even so, we didn't know how many people would come forward and register. Over 1,400 people did. That was a lot. Um, over a thousand reports were received. This was in a three-week period, and it distilled down to about 138 vulnerabilities. Now that was a wild success compared to they had a regular vendor that was scanning constantly, and maybe they would turn up six or seven vulnerabilities a year. So the value for the money of uncovering those bugs, you know, more chocolate for the chocolate factory, great. But what was happening that nobody actually talks about is that behind the scenes, this was an all-hands-on-deck endeavor. They had to scramble the jets to be able to respond to these to make sure they were getting the fixes on time. They had made a commitment to themselves and the hacker community that they were going to do this right. And they did. They pulled, they pulled off. I think the longest it took to fix some of the issues was six weeks. But when I hear, again, the regulators and the policymakers and the lawmakers glomming onto this idea that bug bounties are going to solve their problems, they lack the understanding of what the heck was going on behind the curtain, how much prep it took and how much learning there was to be had of actually executing it. So the next one we did was hack the army. Oh, and by the way, you know, not in addition to the money, they got little coins that said, you know, uh, there was binary around the edge that said, I hacked the Pentagon. You know, those were the Pentagon coins, right? The army, so that, that's um, Secretary of the Army Fan, uh, Fanning. At the time, we took this picture, you know, we announced hack the army, and he was saying, okay, for our coins, um, could the binary around there could that say beat Navy? <laughs> if you get a hand on one of those coins, it says beat Navy. So, um, and actually they did for the first time in over 50 years. I'd like to say the bounties were involved. Um, but yes, that was his idea. But here are the results of this. So first thing we did was we restricted the participation. We capped it because that, were too, that was too many. It was too many people, right, for the resources that were brought to bear. This is a different response team who's doing this for the first time. Still got 416, but look at the signal to noise ratio. Much better. Much better. So everybody wants to talk about wild success, lather, rinse, repeat, cookie cutter, just do it again and again. It's all going to be great. Proven success. But it also says the first vulnerability report was received in the first five minutes instead of the first 13 minutes. We did learn not to open the doors at midnight from the other one. So we did not do that again. I think it was like high noon or something. So yes, lessons were learned. Iterations were had. Bugs were found. 
chocolate came into the factory, you know. But there were adjustments to be made in process and preparedness. So now, I guess, they did hack the Air Force. They're doing a series of them, you know. They're just going to keep hacking their way through. But the other important thing that happened at this time, at the announcement of Hack the Army that got buried, was that they realized that not just during a bounty period do they need to be open to hearing from the public about vulnerabilities. They need, the Department of Defense needs to enact a, if you see something, say something, open vulnerability front door. And so they announced that at the same time too. So all of the Department of Defense, whether or not the bug is covered by a, a currently running bounty program, is now open to hearing from anyone if they found a bug. That's not going to be restricted via country of origin, et cetera. Other interesting part of that is that from the consideration, from the legal consideration standpoint, how many of you have heard of Computer Fraud and Abuse Act? Okay. So the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is basically a, a you know, anti-hacking law, right? Um, but a lot of activities to discover vulnerabilities actually fall under the CFAA. Even forced browsing, looking for, you know, looking for URLs that aren't linked to on a website. That is technically a felony, CFAA, you know, uh, a violation. Don't admit to you didn't know that and you just did that. Don't, don't do that now. Uh, this is being recorded. But, um, <laughs> but the fact is most people don't even know how extensive it is. So one of the things that happens is basically an exemption to the CFAA that's written into some of these policies. When you're the Department of Defense, you need to preserve your ability not just to go after criminals, but to go after nation states. So we worked with the Department of Justice on wording that policy such that it preserved that ability to go after our enemies and not actually give them a blanket exemption to hack the Pentagon. So these are some of the complexities. Again, it's all the stuff that is behind the curtain. Okay, so what's next? Wave of bug bounties? Well, that's one way to do it. See, these are the things that I'm, I'm concerned about, right? These are some of the agencies that have either started them or you know, are planning on starting them. But <laughs> it's, a way, it's a quick way, if you haven't thought through exactly what you want, when you want it, what your capacity is, it's a quick way to get bees or ants or any number of things. I mean, I deliberately chose bees and then an, a reference to the cartoon Archer, where they would say, do you want ants? Because this is how you get ants. Because I'm deliberately mixing the kind of bug you're getting. You're, if you start a bug bounty program and you're not prepared and you're not focused, you're going to get a whole lot of what you didn't ask for. And you're going to have to sort through it. OK, so one does not simply walk into vulnerability coordination across a complex supply chain. Uh, somebody else made this for me because I said it, and then they made that. Um, but <laughs> but uh, again, my, my slide creation abilities have not changed over the years. Um, but we're here in, a, in an environment where it's not just one bug, one bounty anymore. That's not, that's not really how we should be focusing those resources. There are more efficient ways to learn about the one bug, one bounty, the low-hanging fruit. You will hear from my former company and a whole lot of others that bug bounties are cheaper than pen tests, than penetration tests. They're more cost efficient. And I'm like, huh, that cross-site scripting vulnerability that an old hacker like me should not still be able to find and yet I can? That's something you could have hired an intern to do. And they could do other things for you. So no, the true cost is that you didn't invest in security early enough. And you can't use this as you know, just like just outsource it to a bug bounty company and they'll, you know, they'll take care of all that low hanging fruit for us. So I could give an entire presentation about the vulnerability coordination maturity model that I use with my clients. We are not going to talk about it here, except that you need a whole lot more than just engineering capabilities to pull off a vuln coordination program or a bug bounty program. And this is something that I worked with DOD over a period of time with the UK government where we announced that we're doing vulnerability coordination pilot programs and it's to actually go through these capability areas. Engineering is just one. Executive support, obviously, you know, the organizational stuff. Communications, analytics, and incentives, and it's not all money. God, they love those coins, right? They love them. At Microsoft, before we paid bounties, I would pay maybe a one-time cost of $3,000 to a graphic designer to design Xbox avatar clothing 
that I could hand out in, indefinitely, one-time download codes. So I paid the money once, and I'm handing out download codes for a black hat, a black t-shirt that says hacker, and people were going nuts. They were just absolutely dying for these things. So there are tons of incentives that are non-monetary that will not get you a fistful of bees, right? Um, this is what I'm talking about in terms of the UK government. What I love about their very measured and proper pinkies out, tea sipping way of doing things is that they are not having any plans to do a bug bounty program. They are concentrating on what is on the conveyor belt, what is their capacity to deal with the chocolate coming through. You know, what is their capacity from a department to department stance? What are the requirements that each new service has to be able to meet in order to join the unified front door for reporting vulnerabilities? What kind of response capabilities? How many Lucy's, how many Ethel's are back there waiting for that chocolate and can put the wrappers on it and take care of it? So they're doing this in a very measured approach, and I love it. So in the end, Somebody, whether it's a partner, somebody in your supply chain, or you hear about the next heart bleed, you will have a vulnerability disclosed to you through some channel. Your operational capacity and your process is what you really need to shore up, and this is where we are missing all of this preparation. <laughs> Generally speaking, assess your capabilities, assess your goals. If you want cheap pen testing, maybe hire an intern. You know what I mean? Instead of outsourcing this, to a bunch of people who have a lot of expectations of you, especially they're expecting you to be capable of handling the volume that they send. Um, build your capacity and then invest in security way earlier, right? I mean, you guys probably don't have a lot of choices in what you can procure as a government you know, organization, but you certainly have choices in terms of how you handle the ongoing operational security. So my brother runs the Boston Marathon, or he did, and everything. I, my joke is that he's the athlete and I'm the mathlete, but he always told me, don't try and run a marathon if you haven't been exercising. So don't try and do a bug bounty program. It would be like couch to 5K in one day, right? And finally, bug bounties are an expression of vulnerability sourcing that you can't fully control. You can try and design those narrow incentives like I was talking about with the, with the uh, Microsoft bounties. But ultimately, you can't control what they're going to do with it, right? And then, you know, in the regulatory space, for those of you who care about policy, it's not like the folks that drafted the Boston R arrangement intended to block or stop the information exchange that's necessary for internet defense, vulnerability disclosure, or anything like that. They just didn't know who to ask. And I'm hoping that more people who are technical practitioners will volunteer a little bit more of their time in an open and learning kind of way. Because I've learned a lot, way too much, about export control than I ever, ever wanted to. But it was necessary for me to gain that understanding of what their goals were in order to help them and have them stop messing up the rest of our goals, right? So last thing is that, you know, when I talked about this at NATO, they wanted, you know, kind of a, a directed, what is NATO, what can NATO do about this? And I'm kind of looking at it like we have a borderless internet. We're not going to be, just like the Voss in our countries are only 41 and we're going to have to share information in order to protect ourselves and the rest of the internet with countries uh, and people outside of Voss in our, similarly outside of NATO. Right? That was also the day that the kafifi. So I had to put a kafifi. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. But I, what my point was is that we are, we, are, we are having to address this from a global capacity. The last thing I will say about where your allies may come from by surprise is that we had a, uh, we had a hacker who reached out to Microsoft during my time there saying, I think I have an entry for the $100,000 mitigation bypass bounty. And for legal reasons, we'd have to ask them a series of questions, like, what country do you live in? You know, things like that. And he was in Syria. And I said, I am so sorry. We can't accept your entry. We can't even look at it. Um, and we can't pay you. And he hadn't sent his entry yet. You know, he just said, I think I have something. 
And his response was, oh, that's okay. And he gave it to us. He just handed it to us. Something that would have been incredibly valuable for him himself to use or to sell. And he came from Syria. I don't know where he is. I don't know what he's doing now. We've, we have so few people worldwide who have the capacity to find and exploit that level of vulnerability, that level of deep platform knowledge that will advance security science. It should not matter who they are or where they come from. We need them all. So we can't just be waiting, <coughs> waiting for NATO. That would be a theater of the absurd. Okay, thanks.